if you haven't heard it yet, Happy New Year. Again, it is just a wonderful day to be here in the house of the Lord. It is just an awesome time to celebrate um, <laughs> what officially I would say is the start of winter for Houston. It is what it is. I woke up this morning and I saw my phone. Uh, it's going to be 42 degrees colder than it was yesterday. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I guess that's what we have to deal with. So welcome to Houston if you haven't been here before. But we start off this new year and we're actually going to be diving into a new little mini-series for the month of January. And I wanted to dive into what does it mean for us to be of God, All right? I wanted to see what does it mean for each man, every woman, every child, what does it mean to be of God? And before we can dive into what it really means for us to be of God in our individual roles as a man, woman, or child, we first need to understand who exactly God is, right? And so what I want to do this morning is I want to dive into the heart of God. I want us to look at a story that expresses who God is, what Jesus came to do, so that we can further understand really what is the heart of God. That way, in the following weeks, as we dive into each of these individual roles, whether it be a man, woman, or child, we can understand what it means to really be of God. And so I'm going to dive right in here because we have communion here in just a few minutes. And there's quite a bit to come to to unpack here. So we're just going to get right into it. So if you have your Bibles, if you have your devices, we're going to be in John chapter 8. John chapter 8. If you're new to church and everything like that, if you open up your Bibles, you're going to push about two-thirds of the way through. You'll find the Gospels. It'll go Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Once you find that fourth one, just keep flipping, and you'll find the eighth chapter, and you'll be right with us here. And so as some of you are getting there, let me give you a little bit of background as to where we are here, not only in John chapter 8, but also specifically on this passage. Because in some of your Bibles, if yours is like mine, yours may have this section either in brackets or maybe there's a little uh, editor's note at the very top that says this may not have been in the earliest manuscripts. And so there actually is some debate as to whether this was really part of the Gospel of John. And many theologians will say, this is my theory as to why it should be in the Gospel. And many will also argue, this is why it should not be in the Gospel. But the reason why I feel okay bringing a message over this chapter and over this section specifically here this morning is that in looking at this passage, it fits the context of where we are here in John. But also, at the same time, this really expresses the heart of God. Whether we were to look at this passage or to look at a plethora of other passages, the heart of God is still expressed in the exact same way. So for those who may feel like we shouldn't be looking at this passage, then very well, we could go and find, again, a handful of the passages to say this exact same thing. But the reason why I'm using this one is because I I feel like this expresses the the heart of God in the most succinct and the most uh, expressive way that I could find. And so this is the one that I wanted to kind of dive into here this morning. And so again, right before what we have happening here in John chapter 8 and chapter 7, Jesus has been teaching in the temple, right? He's in Jerusalem, and he's teaching, and he's challenging beliefs. He's challenging and inspiring people. And he has these religious leaders who are upset with how Jesus is doing things. They're upset, honestly, more with what he's saying. Because Jesus is not only speaking as like a teacher, like I would be here. I teach on what Jesus has taught. But again, Jesus is teaching as if he's the authority, because... Again, as we know to this day, he is the authority. But in those days, again, he was speaking as if he was God. And for them, that upset them. They didn't understand that. They didn't like that. And so they were not happy with how Jesus was teaching. And so they started planning and plotting and trying to figure out ways that they could trap and how they could arrest and ultimately how they could execute Jesus. And so chapter 8 begins day 2 of teaching that Jesus has in the temple. And that's where we pick it up. And we're going to pick it up here in verse 2. So, verse 2 reads for us here. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. And so let me pause here. What I want to dive into here first this morning is to lay out the trap that the Pharisees have for Jesus here. I want to look at the trap that they're laying for Jesus. In order for us to really understand the rest of the passage, in order to understand the significance of what Jesus does, we need to understand the significance of the predicament that he's in. We need to understand the trap that the Pharisees have laid before him. And so again, 
from the beginning. We have Jesus' teaching here at the temple. And all of a sudden, these men just open up the doors. They come in with this woman. Right? Imagine if we're here in our service right now, and we're just going through, we're going through our service, and suddenly police officers just enter into our, our, our service here, and they just throw this woman and say, like, she's guilty of whatever, adultery, of, of murder, of whatever it is. What do you say we should do to her? Right? This is what Jesus is experiencing. He's just teaching from the, the scriptures, and these men just come in, these Pharisees and scribes who would have been the religious authority, the religious law, they come before and they say, here is this woman caught in the, act, in the act of adultery. What do you say that we should do? Because according to the Jewish law, she is to be stoned to death. She is to be executed. And just to show that they're not just making stuff up. These scribes and Pharisees aren't just trying to say things to trap Jesus by making up lies. Let me turn with us. I'll, I'll put it here on the screen so you don't have to go there. But Leviticus 20 is what is Deuteronomy 22. And I want to read these specifically for a reason. This is the law that they're quoting. It says from Leviticus, if a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And then Deuteronomy says something very similar. If a man is found lying with the wife of another man, both of them shall die. The man who lay with the woman and the woman. So you shall purge the evil from Israel. So when you look at these two passages, what do you notice is missing from what's happening here in our story with Jesus in John chapter 8. Where's the man? Right? Where's the man in this story? Like if this woman has been caught in adultery, you need somebody to be in adultery with, and yet they have no person. You can't commit adultery by yourself. And so here, the religious leaders, they bring forth this woman, and they bring forth only the woman. And the question becomes like, why would they do this? Why wouldn't they bring the man to justice as well? And John goes through this. He illustrates this in his kind of passage. He explains in chapter 6, and I'll go back here a little bit. He explains in chapter, or I'm sorry, in verse 6, that they did this to test him. They did this to test Jesus. The reason why they don't bring forth the man is because the Pharisees and the scribes, they're not interested in real justice. They're not interested in the mercy coming from God. They're not interested in really enforcing the law. They're more interested in trying to trap Jesus. In our day and age, if the laws, if the cops, if the, the people in authority, if they tried to do this to us, this is something we would call entrapment. This is one of those rare things. It's a positive defense is what they say that you can take. And I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a police officer. So don't quote me on how you would use this. If you show up to court trying to say, I'm not going to be there. I won't help you with this. But to explain a little bit of what entrapment could look like in our day and age, imagine if you're driving, right? And you're, you're in your car. Everything is fine. And suddenly the police officer comes up behind you, he turns on his lights, and he comes on the loudspeakers and says, your vehicle is suspicious, and we're suspecting it that it might be stolen. Would you pull over? And you're at a red light, and he tells you on the loudspeaker, run the light, pull up forward, and go over there and pull into this place, wherever it is. And then when he gets to your car, he inspects it, he looks at it, and he says, okay, yeah, this is not the car that we were looking for, but because you ran that red light, I'm going to give you a ticket. Like, he traps you in that. He makes you break the law, and then he gives you a ticket for breaking the law. You cannot do that. In a court of law, they would find you innocent of said crime. And this is what the Pharisees and scribes are trying to do to Jesus right now. They're presenting a law that could be broken in order so that Jesus would break a law. And if you're wondering how this would work out, how the laws that would be broken here before us, here's what Jesus has to choose from. If Jesus follows the law, right, if he enforces the Mosaic law and stones the woman, he's actually breaking Roman law because the law of Rome does not allow regular everyday people to execute people. This is still true for us today. We can't come over and say, like, I don't like what you've done and I'm going to kill you. We can't do that. We have to go to a higher authority. And that's the same thing that's happening here. In fact, if you notice, even at the end of it, when they try to execute Jesus, it's not the Pharisees who say, let's kill him. They take him to Pontius Pilate because the authority does not lie with the Pharisees. It lies with Rome. And so the predicament that Jesus is in here is if he says, follow the Mosaic law, stone her, he breaks the law of Rome and he could be then arrested and executed. At the same time, he's looking at what Jesus has taught. If you go back to chapter 3, you hear this famous saying that Jesus has, that he came not to condemn the world, but to save it. He came not to condemn the law, but to fulfill it. 
And so if he's to contradict and say, well, I don't want to follow the Mosaic law the way that it's supposed to be, then he's going to be somebody who contradicts the law and contradicts himself. But if he says the opposite of it, if he says, okay, well, I'm not going to say to stone her. If I'm going to say, we should let her go, we should give her grace, we should give her her mercy, we should do all these things that I've been trying to to preach and and to proclaim in the ministries that I've been doing. If this is what Jesus says to let her go, then he isn't holding to the law of Moses. And how can someone claim to be a law of the prophets, to be somebody who fills the law when they don't enforce the laws themselves? It'd be like somebody saying that I'm vegetarian while I'm eating this steak. It's like somebody telling you, like, hey, I'm a pacifist, while they're punching you. It's somebody saying, hey, like, I, I'm an honest man while I'm stealing your wallet. You cannot put these two things together. And so that's the trap that the Pharisees and the scribes have laid before Jesus. Either Jesus breaks the law of Rome, breaks what he contradicts himself to be saying from earlier times, or he breaks the Mosaic law and loses all authority that he would have to teach. And so this is a tough situation. This is a good trap, essentially, that the Pharisees have laid. And so let's continue, and let's see what Jesus does in verse in the back half of 6 as well as verse 8. So Jesus reads to us here, Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and he said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. Here, I want to go over what is the response that Jesus has for us. And of course, Jesus, just being who Jesus is, he responds in a way that no one else would ever think to, and honestly, that no one else ever could respond to. Right, I think it's hilarious. The first thing he does is that Jesus bends down and he writes with his finger on the ground. This is the only time we have in all of our Bible that Jesus writes something. And of course, we're not told what he actually wrote. But that doesn't stop people from speculating. There are lots of theories, and again, lots of things, that this pastor, this theologian says, I think he may have written about this, or I think he may have written about that. My favorite one, actually, is that some people say that when you look at the word, um, grapheo is to write, but this is katagrapheo, which means to kind of write against. And so they're saying, like, okay, so Jesus is actually writing against the first scribes and Pharisees. He's writing their names down, and he's writing the sins that they've committed. Now, I just think if that's what he's doing, I mean, it's like, Jesus is savage. He's just sitting here writing out the sins that you have, that you've been doing. Like, that's, that's savage. I can't think of anything better to respond with than that. But I don't think that that's actually what he's doing. And the reason why I don't think that that's what he's doing is if you look in verse 7, they continue pressing Jesus. I don't know about you, but if I'm accusing somebody, like, hey, what are you going to do? How are you going to solve this? What are you going to do to make this happen? And then you start writing my name down and writing sins that I've done, I'm not going to be like, hey, I'm going to... What are, you, what are you doing there? Like, why, why are you writing my name? Why are you, who, who said that I did those things? Like, it's going to stop me in my tracks. So I don't know if that holds water. I just thought it was funny of just how savage the people thought that Jesus could be. But whatever it is that Jesus wrote, whatever it is that he chose to write in the ground, he finished what he wanted to write for that time being, and he stood up, and he said one of the most famous lines that people quote to this very day and many people take out of context of what it's supposed to mean. Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Well, many times we just hear, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. When people are saying this, they're telling, they're trying to tell you when they quote the statue, like you shouldn't judge. You have no right to judge this person before you. But if you study through what Jesus teaches, if you study through what the Bible teaches, we're supposed to judge. You're just supposed to judge rightly. You're supposed to judge justly. In fact, even, again, the day before, in chapter 7, if you go through and you look at verse 24, Jesus says, do not judge by appearances. Judge with right judgment. And this is just one example. And I go to this one because he just said this. He just said that you are to judge, but you judge rightly. You judge justly. And so what most commentators are actually saying that Jesus is telling us to do here is twofold. First, he's saying that the law is actually stipulating that the person who caught the adulteress should be the one to throw the first stone. So Jesus isn't supposed to stone her, but the one who caught the adulteress who was not living in sin, who was not committing adultery, that's the person who's supposed to initiate the stoning. That's the person who's supposed to throw the first stone. 
So some people would argue that what Jesus is saying here is whoever caught this person in adultery, they need to throw the first stone. The second half of this is what they say is that Jesus is actually trying to point out that their judgment is in sin. That they are living in sin if they're trying to cast the first stone. That again, the, the point and the purpose of the law of God is to glorify God, is to, to bring mercy to his people. And yet these people here, these Pharisees and scribes, they're using God's law for their own selfish desires. Again, they don't like who Jesus is. They don't like the teachings that Jesus is teaching. And so instead of using God's law to glorify him, instead of using God's law to bring uh, his name to more people, instead they're using this law for their own popularity and their own selfish desires. They're using it to trap Jesus. Well, the question kind of becomes, like, how do you trap somebody with the law that they wrote? Like, how do you correct someone on the writings that they wrote themselves? How do you educate someone on a system they created? Like, this reminds me of, like, I remember trying to play, uh, it was essentially Pokemon cards with my cousin, my nephew, actually, rather. And again, he didn't know how to play, so he was making him his own rules. And I was trying to listen. I was trying to figure out, like, okay, like, how do I play by his standards? How do I play by his rules? And everything that I tried to learn all just pointed to him winning. And so after a while, it's like, that's, that's basically the game. It's not to actually play Pokemon, it's to play so that he wins. Every time I would think of like, oh, hey, like you said that you could do this, so if I do this, I would beat you here. And he'd be like, no, but then I could just do this. And I'm like, but you didn't tell me that. Like, you didn't tell me that that was a rule that was supposed to be enforced. And it's because he's making the rules as he goes. He's the one who created the system. He's the one who's creating the rules. I can't win in the system. If Jesus is the one who wrote the law, if Jesus is the one who created the law, how can you try to use the law to trap Jesus? Again, Jesus isn't just making up new things as he goes, like my nephew was, but he's quoting and he's knowing the law so much better than the Pharisees, not only in what the laws say, but in what the laws are supposed to do. And so these Pharisees and scribes trying to come to Jesus, trying to explain to him what the law is, they're basically trying to god explain to God, right? And again, this just makes no sense. Like, what is the audacity that we have behind these people? And so we have just this perfect response from Jesus. That in his one question, he points out not only the laws that he's actually supposed to follow, but he points out the hypocritical nature that these Pharisees and scribes actually have. In one, question, in one question, Jesus gets out of this trap and he puts the Pharisees and scribes in their place. And then he goes back to writing their names back on the ground and writing more sins on the ground. You know? That's just what he does. It's just savage. It's crazy just what Jesus does. And so the last thing I want to dive into is in verses 9 through 11. And it says, But when they, they being the Pharisees and scribes, but when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. The last thing that we want to look at here, that we've now seen the trap that the Pharisees tried to set for Jesus, and now we see the response that Jesus had, we need to see the results of everything that's been given to us. And we're going to look at this in three major groups. The first group that we're going to look at and the results that they had were the Pharisees and scribes. Second, we're going to look at the result from the woman. And then finally, we'll look at the result from Jesus. So first, look at the Pharisees and the scribes. We see from verse 9, the first thing they did when they heard Jesus say these things, they went one by one and left. They dropped their rocks, they let go of the things that they were holding on to, and they left. They were no longer standing there. They were no longer standing against this woman, ready to kill her. Their hearts were so full of hatred that they had, and they were ready to execute a woman who was guilty, but they were ready to execute a woman just to enact the plan that they had, just to enact the trap that they had for Jesus. Now, looking at ourselves, I'm sure that many of us can say that there are people that we strongly dislike in our lives. In fact, I would venture to say that there are probably some people that we would say, like, I kind of hate them. Like, I know I'm not supposed to say that, but I, I kind of hate that guy. 
But I would argue that for all of us, none of us would go to the extent of planning and plotting against somebody that we strongly dislike. And even if we did have some kind of like, well, if I do this and at least they'll look bad, we're not gonna take it to the extent of like, well, if I kill this person, then they're gonna look worse, right? Well, we're not gonna commit murder to justify our hatred. I think about how far gone these Pharisees are, these people who are supposed to uphold the law, that they're willing to kill somebody just to prove their point to Jesus. They're willing to commit murder just to prove that they are more right than he is. But when Jesus shows wisdom, grace, and mercy, the results that the Pharisees and scribes have is they have to just let go. Again, I can imagine that they were there with rocks ready to throw at her. And all they could do was just drop them. All they could do was just let the rocks go and move on. That's the response that we can expect anybody who brings hatred or evil to Jesus. You have to let the things go. You have to let your rocks go. You have to let your anger go. You have to let your animosity go, your hostility go. You have to let your wrath go. Ultimately, you have to let your sin go. And so that's what I think the response from the Pharisees and the scribes are, is that they have to let go. The second thing that I think is ultimately more importantly is a result result that we get from the woman. At the end of verse 9, again, we see that Jesus is now left alone with the woman. And as this passage reads, don't think of it like it's now just like him and her and Jesus, rather, and like everybody's left. No, it's in the same way that I would say, like, I'm alone on stage. Like, you guys are still here with me, but I'm alone on this stage. This is the same way. Jesus is alone in front of the crowd with her, but there are still people with him. And it would be, again, this situation where he now comes and he says to her, Woman, where are those who condemned you? Is no one left here? And again, I'm paraphrasing basically what Jesus is saying. And then again, when we hear this term woman, like we may think like, oh, it sounds so offensive. Like how is it just like woman? Like, no, that's not not really what Jesus is saying. This is a term of endearment. This is a a very um, passionate term, a very, very endearing term. This is the same word that he used for his mother back in the wedding at Cana. He said, woman, why have you called me here? This would be the same for us. We could just exchange this to say, madam, madam, Is no one here to condemn you? And the response to her, from her rather, is she says, no one, Lord. She replies to Jesus, no one, Lord. And this is something so easy to miss because it's only three words to say, but the result that she has is she's now placed her faith in Jesus. Because if you look back to verse 4, The only address that we have from the Pharisees and scribes to Jesus is they call him teacher. Literally, they call him rabbi, more specifically. And so all she's known this person as, maybe she's heard of Jesus, maybe she's heard the name, maybe she's heard some things he's done, but this is her first time encountering, this is her first time meeting this Jesus person. And the first thing that she's heard is this is a teacher, this is a rabbi, but she doesn't address him that way. She doesn't address him as teacher. She doesn't address him as rabbi. She addresses him as Lord. She addresses him as Savior. She addresses him as Messiah. She has placed her faith in the one who has saved her. That is the result that we have when we come to Jesus. When we place our faith in the one who has saved us. That there is no one left to condemn us. And so finally, the last result that we have to look at is the one from Jesus. So after this woman responds to Jesus, he turns to her and he then says what we have in verse 11. Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Again, Jesus acknowledges she was guilty, right? He doesn't dismiss the sin and say like, okay, like these guys are gone. Go back to your life of adultery. He says, no, you were living in adultery and you should now go and no longer live in adultery. Again, Jesus does what the law of God was created to do, to glorify God and to show mercy to his people. And again, this kind of shows to us that just because you've placed your faith in Jesus doesn't mean that you can continue to live in sin. That just because you're here in his house on Sunday doesn't mean that you can just do whatever you want Monday through Saturday. You aren't magically made perfect. You aren't now innocent of all crimes that you commit. 
It's not like if you started driving outside the street right now and you were speeding and a cop pulls you over, he's not going to be like, oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry. Did you pull out of West Houston? Oh, my bad. I'm, I'm going to let you go. You keep on going. My fault. I didn't, I didn't mean to pull you over. You pulled out of West Houston. You're good. No, just because you are here at church doesn't mean that you can now go forth and sin more. When Jesus comes forth, when Jesus calls you, when you put your faith in Jesus, when you believe in the work that he's done on the cross, you are to go forth and sin no more. We make a commitment to Christ to sin less, not to be sinless, but to sin less than we did before. That's the result that we see from Jesus, that we are to sin less, that we are to commit our lives to being a better reflection of Jesus Christ. As to close out this morning, we have to go back to what we started with this morning. What does the heart of God look like? And then looking at this story and seeing how Jesus responds to the sins of this woman and how he looks at the hypocritical nature of the Pharisees, I think we can focus on one thing. God hates sin, but he loves the sinner. As cliche as that may sound, as many times you may have heard that or seen that on bumper stickers or wherever it is, on coffee mugs, it's still 100% theologically accurate. When Jesus said to go and sin no more, he showed grace to the sinner, but not to the sin. Jesus said, repent adulterer by not committing adultery any longer. He said, repent to a thief by, by saying, don't continue to steal. He said, repent to a liar by not continuing to lie to other people. He says to repent of your jealousy, repent of your greed, repent of your pride, of your lust, repent of whatever it is that pulls you away from Jesus. But at the same time, Jesus said that even when the people of this world condemn you, even when the people bring you forward to throw stones at you, to murder you, to execute you, I do not. And the reason why I don't do that is because I came to die for your sins. That while you deserve to be stoned and executed, I'm going to take your place. And I'm going to do so on the cross so that whoever would believe in me would have eternal life. That whoever would believe in me would be saved, not just now, but for all eternity. That's the heart that God has for his people that we are created not in God's physical image, that we are created in the heart of God. See, when the Babylonian Empire came and they conquered Jerusalem, they came and the first thing they wanted to do was to destroy the temple because that's what the, the city revolved around. That's usually what people gave people morale. And so when they conquered the city, they came to the temple and they wanted to destroy the idol of God. Because that's how all the other religions work. They always had an idol at the center. And so the, ba the Babylonian Empire, they came in, they entered the temple, they entered the Holy of Holies, the center of the temple, and they found nothing. And they were shocked, they were confused, they were bewildered, they had no idea what to do with this. Because they were looking for an image of God. But they didn't understand that we aren't created in the image, the physical image of God. We are created in the heart of God. That each one of us is in the heart of God. And that the heart of God is in each and every one of us, and it's our job to grow it, to show it, and we're to tell it to the world. That's who he's created us to be. That's what it means for us to all be of God, is to be in the heart of God and to show it to the entire world, to continue to demonstrate the grace that we don't deserve to those around us, to continue to share the love of God that we don't deserve to those who need it more, for us to continue to be grace for us to continue to show love, for us to continue to share the gospel to the ends of the earth. Not just to the ends of the world, but to the people in the room, to the people across the street, to the people in our workplaces, to the people in our schools. We're to glorify God by sharing his heart, by growing our hearts for him, and continuing to love the people, not only here in this room, but around the world as well. That is the heart of God, and that's what we start off with this morning. That's what we start off with in this series. And I wanted to start here specifically, and this is the last thing I'll say about this. I wanted to start here specifically because as we dive into what it means to be a man of God, what it means to be a child of God, a woman of God, there may be things that we may not agree with. There may be things that our culture may not like. There may be times that we feel like we're being personally attacked. There may be times when we feel like, I don't know if I agree with that. I don't know if that's something that I want. 
But we have to remember that the heart of God surpasses the things that we want, surpasses the things that this culture says are right, and it shows us the love of God, the mercy of God, and the purpose of who God is. And so I look forward to diving into all these different topics with you. I look forward to expounding on what it means for us to be men, women, and children of God. And as we do all of these three things, as we fit into any of these categories, we continue to pursue the heart of God in our lives. So with that, let me pray for us this morning. Father, again, we thank you. We love you. We just come before you. And we just ask that you continue to soften our hearts as we dive into yours. That we will continue to open up who it is that we are. That we continue to lower the walls that we've placed. That we lower to lower the defensive that we continue to set up. And instead, we continue to pursue who it is that you are and how you've come. Again, not to condemn the world, not to condemn the law, but to fulfill it. To bring us grace, to bring us mercy, to bring us love like never before. To experience a love that would send a son to die on a cross for people as sinful as us. And so, Father, again, continue to open us up and allow us to receive your word as we dive into it these next couple weeks. And allow us, again, to be people of God. That we can be men of God, women of God, children of God. And so, Father, again, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this time. And we just pray that you would continue to use us in whatever ways that you will. We do these things and we pray these things all in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.